Right, are we on? Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks to Toby for that. Um, probably for the, for the football sales guys in the room, you, you think, oh my lord, how depressing is that? How on earth am I going to um, get some traction with brands? So hopefully this session will help a little bit with that. Um, before we kick off, could I just, I'm just curious to know the sort of the makeup of the room. Could we have a, a quick show of hands um, for the brands in the room, which I'm assuming is going to be a very small number. One, two, three. Um, so three brands, football clubs, a dozen or so. Um, people from the media, a couple. Um, and kind of if you, you broadly categorize yourself as a supplier, a football supplier, um, what does that leave us with then? There's lots of people in the room. Agencies? Okay, cool. It's just interesting to know the broad makeup of the, of the audience so we can kind of direct our, our efforts. Um, no so what we wanted to discuss, I guess, and to expand a little bit on what Toby um, has discussed is a proposition. Uh, I don't think it's us being, it's us or the European Sponsorship Association being particularly pointy, but it's a proposition that change is required in the world of football. Um, and one feels I'm um, former CEO, 13 years at Fast Track, and I think we felt certainly that there was a groundswell of opinion that change um, was required, not necessarily just in football, but in the way that sponsorship is sold. So really what we wanted to do was get the opinions of, of three terrific brands, one terrific rights holder in the room, and then open it up to the floor to get questions from the floor later on. Um, and the subject of the session, as you've seen from the, from the briefing, is why rights, holders, why rights holders need to start acting like brands. Um, I guess more specifically for this session, um, I translate that as why football rights holders will, benef will benefit from acting and thinking like brands to ensure continued commercial success. Um, four terrific panelists um, representing the brand fraternity. We have Tim, Tim Ellerton, who's um, Global Sponsorship Manager at Heineken in the thick at the moment of, of Rugby World Cup activation, which is kicking off in 10 days' time, yeah. I guess. Um, we have Nathan Homer, Head of Global Sponsorship and Partnerships at Barclays. Again, I guess, in the thick of preparing for Rugby, Rugby World Cup, but also, as you all know, very, very actively currently, very active currently in the world of, of, um, of football. And, and Nathan, and until relatively recently, was at P&G running all of their Olympic programs, so I think that'll be an interesting um, comparison to make. Um, Toby has introduced himself already, and we have Julie from the head of international business development from FC Barcelona. Um, he would describe the most loved football brand in the world, and I'm sure the football people in the room would take issue with that, but no, that's that. yeah, <laughs> tough on them. Um, so um, really I'd like to, dis to, to kind of separate this discussion into two halves. One is um, what's happening today. Um, and then a little bit about what we think tomorrow could look like um, in the world of sponsorship. So could we kick off then um, with just a, a, a brief summary from kind of each of the, the panelists about um, the organizations you work for. And what are the primary business objectives at a holistic level that your businesses are trying to drive? Um, and how has football sponsorship particularly helped your organizations to deliver some of those objectives? Um, and let's start at this end and work along. Okay, morning everyone. Um, it's quite a broad topic, Andy, but uh, I guess for Heineken, we've uh, been involved with Champions League as a company since 1995, uh, sorry, 94, and as a brand since 2005, it was Amstel brand previously. Um, and I guess it, it needs to deliver on a, a number of things. Uh, we obviously need to sell more beer off it. We don't, we, we're not apologetic about that. Uh, we absolutely want to create uh, awareness for our brand and you know, a lot of people think that they've all heard of Heineken, or at least I hope you have, but actually in terms of you know, global beer volume it's only uh, just about 1%. So there's a hell of a lot of work we need to do in terms of awareness that Champions League helps us with. Um, and then thirdly, I guess we want to be part of the conversation. So uh, on any Champions League match night, you only need to look in social channels to see that people are talking about the Champions League and we want to add value to that conversation in a credible way. Um, we've done that through various uh, initiatives, particularly this season, the season just gone and the season prior, with something called hashtag champion the match, which completely dominated the Twitter world during match night with over 80% of the sponsored uh, content was coming from Heineken. So that's something we're very proud of. Um, and I guess they'd be our three main objectives. 
Nathan? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it makes a lot of difference whether you're at Barclays or at uh, Procter & Gamble, where I used to be, you know, and you're selling branded products like Gillette or whatever. I think, you know, fundamentally, you know, most of why you do what you do is for two reasons. In if you sit in the marketing sponsorship world, it's to help your business sell more, because that's what the business is there for, and alongside that, to protect and grow your brand. And those two things are obviously fundamentally interlinked. One is often more short term. I just want to sell more product quickly. And one is more the mid to long term healthy brand that enables the sales of the business. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, quite often when we look at sponsorship or talk about sponsorship, we see people talk about it like it's this unique separate piece. And actually, you know, sponsorship is part of the marketing mix and the marketing is only there you know, as Toby had on one of his charts, you know, how you deliver against your business objectives. So, you know, I don't think, you know, do Barclays do something different with football than Gillette did, for example? No, you know, the, mm. the core things that drive what you do are the same. Um, the product you happen to have are just um, different, but um, I don't think, you know, the, the, the bit that I find challenging is when people kind of separate them out into the business, the marketing, the sponsorship, when, you know, they're, they're clearly just totally interrelated. And we're going to reflect on that a little bit later, I think, in terms of how sponsorship, you know, especially in the world of the Euro European Sponsorship Association, sponsorship used to be this thing that you could identify and point at. And you could point at the sponsorship department and the sponsorship person that just did what they did. They worried about hospitality and branding and not too much more. But actually, the world has evolved miles since then. And so we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later. I don't know, Toby, if you've got anything more to add on that subject from Castrol, from um, some of the organizations you've wor worked with relatively recently. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. I agree with Nathan uh, in, t in terms of, you know, the, the objectives are really pretty much the same across most brands, you know, broadly. You know, you want to shift some brand perception, image, awareness, propensity to purchase, you know, and you want to sell stuff. Um, but the interesting thing is that I've seen is that the way the, way the brands are um, using sponsorship certainly in the last five, 10 years, has shifted from it being a tactic and actually having budgets. You know, there used to be a time we used to go to the CMO and say, can I have some budget? I want to sponsor something. Now, you go to the CMO and, and, and say, here's our sponsorship strategy. Here's what we're going to spend our marketing budget on. You're not, you don't go asking for extra money um, because sponsorship tends to be a core theme in achieving, the point I was trying to make earlier, sponsorship tends to be a core theme in achieving ultimately your business objectives. It's not a tactical thing. You can, can be used tactically, especially when you're talking about launching a product. But generally, you know, big brands like ours would use it at the core of our business. And, and Julia, FC Barcelona, a kind of a similar question to you, just coming from the other side of the fence. What are the brands that are coming to you asking the world's most loved football brands to help them with? What are, what are, the, what are the challenges that brands currently have that they think your football club can help them with around the world? First thing, um, I wish the brands would come to us, as you say. Uh, that would make uh, our job uh, way easier. It's true that sometimes it happens, and FC Barcelona is a very popular brand and property, and it happens from time to time, but we still need to go after the brands and do all the, all the process of, of uh, sponsorship sales, as you, as you were describing. Nothing, nothing is easy in the sales world, and everybody that, can, that is involved in sales know that there's not such thing as an easy, easy sale. No? But I think that answering your question, uh, we, have, we have very different needs uh, from brands or, or requests because um, being a, a global property or, or even a global brand as, as FC Barcelona is, as Nathan uh, was, was probably saying, um, we have companies like and brands like the ones we have here, which are top of the line brands with their processes, internal process, they know their objectives, you know, they, they, they maybe they are not in interested anymore in awareness, they are more interested in other things, what can they do with the club, how can they link to the values, etc. But when you are covering the whole world, you have different markets and different needs. So for instance, a global brand, an American brand or a European brand uh, that is very mature in the world of sponsorship would have a certain need. But when you talk about a company in the Middle East or in South America or in Southeast Asia, maybe the need is completely different. So maybe there are some companies or brands that really are in this initial phase where they require awareness and they want to link to football and FC Barcelona because of that. That's one uh, scenario. The other scenario is that top of the line brands that are really well established, have been doing sponsorship for a long time. They want to do something more 
and this is where what we're saying here is really applicable. We need to think more like the brands. We need the, to change our speech. The LED speech and you know some pictures of where your logo can be, it's not valid anymore for those brands. And Tim, Nathan, I wonder if we could just quickly reflect, because I clearly within your portfolio you do a whole range of things, and Nathan, you've recently been at P&G running, I think, one of the most famous Olympic activation programs, the Thank You Mums campaign, which I know we'll all know about. I wonder if it's worth just briefly reflecting on what football delivers for your organisations and what, Tim, in your instance, what the Rugby and Rugby World Cup might deliver. Nathan, in your example, what the Olympics delivered for P&G um, and what football delivers for Barclays. It's just worth, I think, for, the, for, the, for the, the audience reflecting a little bit on what football's good at and what rugby and the Olympics is good at and whether there's anything football can learn from those things. Um, I think we're involved in, in football and specifically we say we're involved in Champions League football, not necessarily football uh, general, though a lot of our markets do have local deals with various clubs, but let's talk specifically Heineken brand because the Champions League, whilst played in Europe, is ultimately a global property, and there's not that many true global properties, annual ones uh, at least, that uh, they are out there. I mean, obviously, of course, Olympics, Euros, uh, World Cup, etc. that's every four years. Um, the, the beauty of the Champions League, in our opinion, is it plays a dual role. It, as I said at the start, it can play an awareness play in markets where we are very, uh, very small and building our brand, but in markets where we're hugely established or market leader in, say, Netherlands or Spain, uh, Italy, places like that, it actually builds on brand equity and you know, can really shift the dial in terms of uh, you know, our, our sales ob objectives. So that's why we're with that property. I could probably count on one hand the amount of markets that something like cha the Champions League property is not relevant to. Uh, specifically to your question around Rugby World Cup, uh, what we find with rugby is that they are already a very loyal Heineken follower. It tends to, let's be honest, lean to a more premium demographic, which is uh, perhaps more suited to us as the world's international premium beer. Um, but it does cover a small amount of markets, but in those markets such as Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, France, the UK, Ireland, and Argentina to an extent, uh, rugby is hugely popular. And uh, as I say, we've been involved with that sport since 1995, and it plays much more of a loyalty role, um, perhaps more so than Champions League can, specifically in those territories. Nathan, reflecting on your amazing time at P&G around the Olympics. Um, I think I'm the, putting uh, words in your mouth by describing it as amazing, obviously. But so I think yeah, yeah, it wasn't, I'm sure getting the hotels ready in Russia was quite so amazing, <laughs> but anyway, that's a different matter. The, uh, I think the, the fundamental thing, you know, is, is pretty similar to what um, Tim's just described, what you're trying to do in both cases. Um, I mean, what's the difference? You know, the Olympics are every two years. You know, in about 70 of the markets, it was a big two-year sort of three-month focus. What does football do differently? Well, you know, it is pretty much always on there. Yeah. You know, if you take the Premier League as a great example, huge global reach, relevant and a dominant passion in a lot of the markets we play in. In fact, nearly all of them, actually. And it's on all the time. You know, it starts at the beginning of August, it finishes at the end of May, and through the summer there's constant rumours of, you know, transfers, managers, that you can still play off and keep a constant piece. So I think football offers a, a real all year, right? you know, the days of football being a winter game you know, are gone, you know, it, it gives you an ability to tour all year round and, you know, with a, a myriad of assets. Um, I think by far the biggest shift and, you know, the PNG's Olympic campaign was a good example of it. You know, we worked uh, Gillette as a brand at PNG, you know, we worked with over 30 different football organizations, you know, primarily um, national governing bodies. Uh, and again, you know, the simple reason for both of those, which Barclays is probably, we're on an evolution towards is you know using those things not for the blunt awareness because that's not the stage most of those brands are at but using it to really drive engagement and content mm -hmm. you know and you know and you say well why that why is that important you know we're just running a campaign in uh, through africa that is literally about open a bank account take a loan use your credit card to pay for things you know which is what the life cycle they're at in the banking kind of market there and the we ran the campaign without just kind of standalone marketing. We're running it using all of the assets from the Premier League. We see engagement levels go through the roof. And the really important thing is the consideration levels therefore change and consideration turns to purchase. Or, you know, and so we're actually seeing the business style change mm. because the engagement is different. 
you know, what does football bring to our messaging? I always say, you know, we're a bank. It's not that interesting. I'm sure when you get a letter in the post from the bank, you don't open it thinking this will be a good read. I can't <laughs> wait to uh, sit down on the sofa and have a read of it. If I send it you and it's got some of the assets we have from the Premier League in it, it at least makes you think, oh, this looks interesting. And hopefully when you read it, you think, actually, I might get involved. That sounds a bit more of a reason for me to, to lean forward. So, you know, why do we do sponsorship? Well, it's for passion. Why does football work? Because it is a dominant cultural passion in a lot of markets. And the fact now it's very all year round, it, it does offer something that some of the properties don't. And Julie, you were at Cirque du Soleil before you joined FC Barcelona. So I guess you've seen a very, very different proposition to take to market, an entirely different level of passion and engagement that you're now selling, I suppose. No, absolutely, absolutely. And I think what's a bit common with, uh, uh, with FC Barcelona is that we had a story to, 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 to tell and, uh, and it was a lot about brands that wanted to associate to those values of uniqueness, of uh, creativity, of you know, um, being a pioneer in an industry. In the case of Cirque du Soleil, uh, I couldn't count on any LED or any TV exposure, so it was really about that. So it was really about a concept, story, a nice, a nice story, I think, uh, at least back then for sure. And I think that it's, it's at the end, you, you can, it's not replicating, but you learn a lot from what you did in the past. And when you sell, there's some, some, something that is really always common. And I think that, uh, to your point before, Toby, I think that just when you start explaining what's your property, uh, you need to explain what it's, what it's about on the sense of, you know, what, what can it bring on the table? What's, why are we different? Why is Cirque du Soleil something different? What's the story behind it? What's FC why is FC Barcelona different than any other club that is trying to sell sponsorship? I think in both cases, you, you, you need to relate to the, to the tradition, to the, to the history, to, to, to what happened in the previous 20 years, in the case of Cirque du Soleil, 100 years in, in the case of FC Barcelona. And both, when you could enable to, to put this connection with the, with the brand, on a personal level, either because this person likes circus uh, or the Cirque du Soleil uh, concept, or because this person likes the FC Barcelona philosophy, that helps a lot then afterwards to continue the dialogue. It might end up with a sale or not, because you never know, and there are different factors uh, apart than the personal, but it helps you to create this emotional link and to, th to, to position yourself as something different and see if that might work for the brand, but it's something different and special. And I think that when you have a special value, you need to use it a lot yep. in your sales proposition in order to engage with the person that is in front of you and is trying to understand what we can do for them. In terms of, um, if we move to the, the, the kind of tomorrow conversation, it's interesting if we reflect on um, the, the organization that is the European Sponsorship Association, it's interesting about a year ago we sat down and said, um, you know, what do we define our organization as? What do we think about sponsorship? And actually, I think the European Sponsorship Association felt that it was becoming a bit marginalized by trying to point specifically at what sponsorship was about. Um, I think our view was that the industry is moving so fast and that, as we've already heard um, from, from the panel, that sponsorship is now more integrated than it ever has been before. Every single big brand in the world that uses sponsorship uses it across all of their channels. Um, and so marketing directors increasingly are seeing the power of that connection with people's passions, you know, with rugby, with football, um, with the clubs that we've, that we've heard from today. Um, and if we quote ESSA, having done a lot of um, thinking about what the future of ESSA looks like and what the future of the sponsorship industry should look like, Essa would say, we truly believe in the power of sponsorship to inspire more engaging marketing. So that means that sponsorship isn't necessarily a thing, a department that you can point at. Sponsorship is about wrapping this passionate connection with consumers around every piece of marketing that you're doing, every piece of outbound communication that your organization is push pushing out into the world. Um, and that power of inspiring more engaging marketing will, ex will enable accelerated growth by connecting with people through their passions to enhance their experience and forge more meaningful relationships. So that's what ESSA now talk about. And for us, the modern world of sponsorship, there are probably two or three real imperatives. There's this, this, this thought, that, and Tim, you said it earlier, about how do brands tangibly add value to the sporting experience for their customers. So you can't just have 
a sponsorship where there's a logo on the backboard, actually the brand needs to feel like it's adding value, tangibly adding value to their consumers' passions of that sport. I think increasingly, and again we've heard it a lot today, um, rights holders have to allow their partners to tell an active and engaging story about their role in the sport. Don't be afraid actually to allow your sponsors to become part of the narrative of your football club or your league. It's a really, really important thing and all of the brands, not just the three on the stage here, but all brands in the world now, will want to tell a really active and engaging story around their partnership. And storytelling is a thing that kind of every agency talks actively about, not just sponsorship agencies, but advertising agencies and media agencies. We have to think about storytelling. But on that, Andy, just to, just to chip in on that, I yeah, think yeah. you know, one of the most fundamental shifts that certainly I look for is, you know, the days where people turn up, they said, these are our assets, can I have a check? Yeah. You know, they're the last people we yeah. want to deal with. You know, I think the if you talk about what do we want from people, not in the future today, the people that are impressive are people that come and say, this is where we're going, these are the parts of our journey, and we think you guys could be an amazing partner to help us on this part. You know, if you just want us as a partner, because you can give us something to help us, for me, it's a one-way sell. You know, what we want, and the best people that come and sell, are people that are clear on what they're trying to achieve and can see why through a partnership with you, not only can you achieve what you want, which is essential, but actually they understand and tell you why it's important to them and why, because effectively that means you get really active, true collaboration because you're helping them with part of their story as yep, well yep. as helping with it. And I think that's something that you, you don't see in most pictures. So I think that, that change in, you know, not just being willing to let brands tell a bigger story as part of your story, but actually start with that fundamental, which part of our story is that brand gonna help us with? Yeah. And I think, yeah. adding, adding to, to what Nathan is saying, I think that uh, we, at least I personally, the word sponsor, I think sometimes it's, it, it has a bit of a negative connotation on that sense, you know? I think that's why we, we use more and more the word partnership, the word par par partner, because it's where you can have this type of conversation. When you are looking for sponsorship, it really looks like you're asking for money. Mm. And, and yes, you are asking for money, it's true, but, it, but the way things have developed, there are so many things where you can deliver value to both entities mm. that you need to explore those and then ask the money. But if you start the conversation with sponsorship and a fee, it's a very way cold back. way to, to start yeah. and, and it doesn't go that it's well. A real, it's a real evolutionary pressure on the industry, isn't it? Yeah. That, you know, we all, even the, the association still talks about sponsorship and yet the industry is going, well, it's, what does sponsorship mean? And so it is a much bigger thing. And you're right, it's about partnerships, it's about giving it's mindset. Brand. The other thing is, it, it leads to a true difference in mindset and skill set. Mm. You know, if you look, I think, in the past and maybe even today, People are sponsorship experts or marketeers or salespeople. You know, I've done sales training, I've done marketing training, I've done sponsorship. You know, I think in the future, you know, and again, when we look at people, it's very obvious if someone who comes to see you is a salesman only. It's equally very obvious if they're a marketing person only. And you know, in our organization, I see people that are really good at sponsorship, really good at marketing, don't have any idea how those things really connect to commercial um, mm. imperatives. And it's equally true when you see rights holders. You know, when people come, it's really obvious. And the people that stand out are the people that have got a broader, multifunctional, if you want to use the word, skill set. Where, yeah, of course they need to have an element of the skills that are to do with sales. So, you know, you are going to negotiate, you are going to do that kind of stuff. But they also understand the marketing and brand piece. And ideally, have got a, a strong sense of the commercial. Uh, actually, so I think going forward, people yeah. are going to have to have a much broader skill set too. Yeah, the sponsorship, yeah, yeah. The, the, the role of sponsorship manager is dying. Oh, you go to Diageo, they, <laughs> they don't have it. You know, it, you know it, we're a dying breed. <laughs> um, Diageo don't have sponsorship managers, they have brand managers and they do everything. And they have to be, as Nathan just said, experienced in all of those assets. Yeah, but m I think 10 years ago, marketing directors frequently didn't have their arms around sponsorship quite like they do today. And I think now every single marketing director would have ultimate control over the integration of the assets in sport and across their other marketing channels as well. Okay. Um, and so one thing on that is, and if I use the Heineken example, when I joined Heineken seven and a half years ago, uh, it's been as long as that, um, you know, we had sponsorship campaign, we had brand campaigns and then there was this thing called sponsorship campaigns and they lived over here and they didn't really relate to what the brand was talking about. 
now we've launched three campaigns this year, which the Champions League campaign was, was, the, was the biggest, next to the James Bond campaign, which is coming up in the, in the next few months. So we've gone, we've moved from that, oh, what do we do about the sponsorship thing, and we send lots of people to matches and they have a nice time, to that's front and center of our marketing mm. initiative and our campaign, our brands, our market, sorry, are, are planning uh, you know, a year, year and a half ahead of how they're gonna use something like the Champions League, which is why you know, we, we've signed up for, for a further three years um, to build their brand. They're not just saying, well, let's use it for some trade activation like we traditionally did. Mm. Uh, the other thing I think is important is that sponsorship or partnership, whatever we want to call it, uh, has to play a much bigger role than just a branding exercise or, or a, a CSR exercise. It has to work across everything. So we deal daily with the CSR team, the PR team, the trade marketing team, the above the line. You know, it has to affect everything we do. We have an important job on responsible consumption of alcohol. We use our sponsorship platforms for that. Um, so it had to work a lot harder than the traditional logos on a board like the one behind me. Yeah, and, th and that demands a different, again, a different approach from the, from the rights holder community that they, they understand all of that stuff. The, th the third thing, back to the ESSA conversation, I think this, this idea of direct to consumer, uh, I think the rights holders need to recognize that they have to allow brands to use their assets to build direct relationships with their customers, so giving you access to their data, giving you access to their, their social and, and digital channels so that that direct-to-consumer channel is open to them. And again, I, I, I've worked with brands where that's been a real challenge with the football community, and so that's another thing that everybody needs to keep, keep in mind. But all of that clearly adding value about storytelling, about direct relationships, all of that clearly is still underpinned, as Toby said earlier, by kind of the, the basic essence of this industry, which is about um, driving awareness, about building visibility, um, and um, that's ultimately one of the one of the key things that underpins why brands do sponsorship. So, so the question, I guess, that we're moving towards is, you know, do we need to shift the focus of the football community from principally an asset sell? Toby, you mentioned that earlier about shirt and perimeter and backdrop um, and hospitality, and move towards partnerships that offer smart access to data, genuinely integrated digital and social. Um, assets that help the way you can tell your story around this sponsorship, supported by those traditional assets that are an important part of what, what you buy. Um, but also, I think quite importantly, a more proactive approach by the, the clubs and the rights holders themselves to put really good creative ideas in front of you. Um, I think if that's happened, I think the, the industry would move forward quite quickly. So let me go back to the panel again then with that in mind. And we talked a little bit, touched on this a little bit, um, the sponsorship dynamics in your business. Are you being asked to do different things, think about different things, use those assets in a different way? Are the people above you in your organizations challenging you in a, in a different, more unique way than they ever have before? Or is it more or less the same? Um, it probably depends where you are. I don't mm. think, uh, I think if you take a company like P&G, you know, sponsorship has always been totally embedded in the marketing and the marketing yeah. people run the business. So you have a very rounded kind of engagement. I think someone like Barclays, it's more of a journey where you have maybe traditionally had the business, the marketing, the sponsorship mm. groups, and there's a journey to kind of bring that stuff together. But I mean, I think the stuff we talked before is just stands true, which is, you know, people that are bring, bringing a piece of, you know, this is why we genuinely want you as a partner. This is the role we can help you with and you can help us with, you know, let's build that. That's the story we could build together. And then on top, there's some of the stuff I could almost do the traditional things matter? You know, billboards, hospitality, you know, they're almost the easy yeah. ones. Do they matter? Yeah, they do, yeah. actually. You know, yeah, yeah, taking yeah. our clients to stuff and being able to go in the director's box and then meet players with top clients is important. It really is, because with them, the core marketing objective is actually about relationship and trust building. And that comes from having that special money can't buy experience. So it's not that all the old assets aren't worth having, they yeah, are, yeah, yeah. but for me, they almost become the simple bit of quick negotiation and actually the real meat in the discussion of the partnership now is you know the, the other things around that that allow you to really tell the story and engage mm. yeah I, I think i think from my own experience at heineken certainly i don't think anyone's doubting our sponsorship portfolio or at least i hope they aren't um you know we've been heineken cup lead sponsors since 95 we've been rugby world cup the champions league for as long as uh, 20 years uh, just had our 21st year in fact there's no doubt there what it needs to do however is work a lot harder a loss across a lot more markets yeah, and yeah. that's what we try and categorize our markets by terms of their, their, their size and also their brand position that's not 
you know, that's not rocket science, but what we then do is find, okay, what is it about the Champions League asset that helps a market like uh, the Philippines, where we're just trying to build our brand and, and have only just entered that market very recently, or Netherlands, where we're, you know, 67% market share. So it's about finding the role that Champions League plays across a whole heap of different markets. Yeah. And also, as I said, previous point, you know, not just in the traditional, okay, that's our branding exercise. It needs to work on PR, below the line, CSR, etc. I think the danger that, that uh, sponsorship uh, has within football, for example, is brands like my own, where I've just come from, Castrol, uh, Vodafone to name, name two, who are going and actually creating their own assets. Vodafone pulling out of it, Formula One, pulling out of football. Um, they don't buy assets now, they create their own. And, and Castrol has been doing a bit of that as well. Um, you know, so that's, that's a danger. Big brands actually moving into a space like Red Bull where they're creating their own. I mean, Red Bull make billions out of the content from their partnership program. It's, it's a phenomenal, it's a business now. You know, forget about sponsorship, forget about brand partnership. They are making money out of content from the relationships they have with people in sport and endeavor and activity and whatever. That's gonna happen more and more. And the decision between sponsoring Barcelona, who've got a really nice brand story and loved by the world, or going out and creating their own festival or whatever it might be, which is what Vodafone are starting to do, you know, that's gonna be playing more and more into, into the world. And I think, you know, for me, um, you know, within the brand I've just come from, they're asking that question, you know, is the brand friction, is the sponsorship option as good as creating our own? And Tim, we talked briefly earlier about how some of the rights holders are changing their approach, and mm. you were saying that UEFA are are recognising the change in this in this market. I wonder if just briefly reflect on on that. If there's, yeah, I think uh, that's an example of a of a rights holders. At least we're, we're we're going on a journey with them. So we have regular meetings with them, and they're in particularly their digital department, which is probably the area of most uh, need you know most interest for us to say, look, what is it that you know they've got sixty something million fans on Facebook. We've got eighteen. You know how we how we can create some synergies there. Um, you know, and they're helping us, uh, you know, with our initiatives. So they're posting all our, our content. Uh, we're working together, so it's not just a, uh, that you know that they have a, a different target market than we do in some ways, but also um, their objectives might differ. So we find a common ground. So it's important that we, we take all our partners on that journey. We've done the same with the IRB or now World Rugby, uh, and that's any you know, for any rights holders in the room. That's a, a conversation you know, a brand like us will always want to have. Is okay. What are the objectives we have here? So UEFA, for example, and uh, I see Philippe's in the room, he knows this more than anyone, uh, you know, they are behoven to the 53 or is it 54 unions of Europe. So it's not their job to market the Champions League to, to Asia or South America. However, they come to us because they know we have a footprint in that territory uh, and we do that for them. And, and, and we talk, we, of course, we talk about a Heineken message, we make no apologies for that, but we link our Champions League message to it. So it's a bit cheesy, but it's a win-win si situation. So what, one, more, um, more, one more question from me, and then we're going to open, open it up for, for 10 minutes or so of questions from the floor. So do have a think about questions if you have one, um, and, and we'll, we'll take them in about five minutes. So the final thing then, I just wanted to reflect a little bit more on what Toby was saying earlier about the number of proposals that the, the people on the, on the, uh, the stage get, and, and also, Julie, from your perspective, the proposals that you push out into the world. So Barclays last year, I think this is the right number, got 9,645 sponsorship approaches. Um, and it sounds like there's a pretty rigorous process in place um, to deal with those and to select the very small number that I'm, I'm guessing gets some traction within the organization. But I wondered if you could reflect on the best proposals, the best approach, how should the world of football and, and sponsorship sales um, be thinking about approaching your organizations. Toby obviously heard you earlier talking about it's all about building relationships, and I understand that completely, having kind of been a, a bit of a salesman within an agency as well. It's exactly the same game. But I wonder if we could reflect on what are the really great proposals you've seen? Have you, have you bought from unsolicited approaches? Um, and what's the best, the, the best way for the salespeople in the room to, to think about coming after your business? I think a key word for me would be, or two words would be, uh, tailored and, and more bespoke. So Nathan is, works for a bank, I work for a beer. It's very obvious when a presentation has just insert 
or find Word Barclays, take it out, put in Heineken. Um, so his objective is going to be very different from ours. Uh, understanding our business, um, you know, we had a, a, a something the other day. Uh, wanted to, we want to sponsor the One Direction tour. The average age of the One Direction fan, I guess, is probably 12 or 13 years old. That's not great for a beer. Um, so it you could know, be a actually, good concert. Though, yeah, it would be good. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, it, it has a really understanding of our business objectives. Where you know, just a, read the annual report. I don't know. Find out where where you know Heineken's uh, ambition are: uh, short term, mid term, long term, and actually make it uh, bespoke to what we need. You know, and and finding ways in which, uh, for example, with the the Dutch Olympic Committee, they came to us because they had a problem back in 2000 that they had loads of supporters. Uh, loads of families going, but nowhere for them to meet. So we created the Holland Heineken House, which was run by Heineken uh, and became the place to meet for Dutch Olympic fans. And now at the last Olympics in, in, uh, in London, it was 8,000 people sold out every single night from fans from all around the world. That's a natural place for Heineken to play, bringing the entertainment, bringing the party, bringing the, the aftermatch, uh, ent uh, you know, social occasion, if you like. So ideas that actually you know, tick a box in up for our brand are always going to be more beneficial than you get this amount of LED boards and this amount of tickets. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that, I mean, that's not a huge amount to add. The, the, the other one that I always say to people is, you know, the, the simple way to get a long list of people is to look at who's already in the industry, who's already in the thing, who's a big brand, who's a, and start going, I'm going to cover those 200. I actually think, because actually to do what Tim's just said takes time and work, is there's nothing wrong with starting with that long list, but then actually to step back and say, what have we got to offer? Therefore, instinctively, which of those does it feel based on what I already know about? You know, and actually, as fast as you can, narrow it down to, don't do 200 where you change the logo and post it. Do 10 where you do yeah. the research and you go, actually, I can see a good connection and fit here. So I mean, my advice is always, you know, yeah. same as who do we look for? Well, we look to target the right consumer and do the, the classic yeah. kind of bullseyeing yeah. in, you know, spend the time on the ones where it feels as if there's a clear link to you. And, and back to, you, and and back back to the if time. you can't do it, and it's the blunt thing, if you can't do it, it says to me, you don't know what you're selling. Actually, one of the best ones we had quite recently was a, a football club that will remain nameless that came in with no presentation, mm. and they listened to us. So normal, well, they, first of all, they got the meeting in the first place, but that was because of the, the level in the world of football they're at. Once they had that meeting, they then said, right, rather than come in and drown you with 50 slides on uh, said football club, we're going to listen to you about where your objectives are, where your business is, what gap this football club might fill that we currently don't have in our sponsorship portfolio, how it would complement what we do with Champions League, for example, and then came back three weeks later and, and presented to us. So, you know, that's another way is, is actually use your ears before your mouth first yeah. to really understand the business and how that works and, mm -hmm. then, and then come back with a proposal bespoke to that uh, to that brand. And connected it to their own brand story, Correct. I guess, as well, which is an important part of the title of the session, I suppose, thinking the about the br yourselves as and a And the brand. other bit that leads to that, and it's a very tough dynamic, because I've sat in a salesperson's yeah. shoes, is instinctively you've got short-term targets and you want to hit them. Whereas actually the people that I'd say I generally will listen to, answer the phone to, have a chat with at something like this, are the people I have built a relationship with. They haven't just tried to cram a square, kind of peg into a round hole for a short-term win. They've kept the thing that actually, you know, whether they work for a rights holder or in, in the business, they've kind of built the right relationship with the right people. And actually, guess what? Three years down the line, six years down the line, nine years down the line, they've come with something that absolutely fits perfectly. And because they've spent the time to show you, they don't just try and flog you stuff. They actually come when it's the right thing. It's got far more credibility, gets listened to far more. And, you know, the, the sale comes then. And, that's a bit of your balancing the, the brand, which is mid to long term, both of yourself personally, by the way, and yeah. uh, of your yeah. your rights, but also um, with the you know the, the short term yeah, yeah. selling. A quick, a, a quick check on it's tough. exactly on you know Wikipedia and Heineken sponsorship will tell you that our three most successful sponsorship, the Champions League, the Rugby World Cup, and the European Rugby Tournament, what was the Heineken Cup, are all at 20 years plus. Yeah. So yeah. we are. <laughs> It's pretty obvious that we're in these, these partnerships for the long term. Uh, so coming in, as Nathan said, with a short-term mentality and a you know, ridiculous number that, that uh, it isn't going to work. It's about, you know, okay, we see that you're on a journey. This is what we want to do years one to three. This is where we see that, you know, our organization benefiting you years three to six, et cetera, et cetera. Julie, the, you know, the, the people that you've been out to tell the FC Barcelona brand story to, where's the, 
What's the, what, where's the, the success come from? What's been the most engaging story there? Our, our approach, it's, uh, it's quite simple, I have to say. Uh, I know that uh, there are some football clubs that, uh, that have a more uh, flashy approach uh, when they visit a brand. Uh, we like to, first we do a bit of work beforehand, as you guys are saying, you know, to see if there's a specific fit with our values, our story, or you know, there's a specific need for a brand that they want to go global and might be the right moment to step in, etc. So there's a pre-work, some research that, that needs to you know, make a link when you connect with somebody. And then, honestly, when we go to visit a uh, marketing director, a CMO, so CEO even, our approach is quite simple. We, 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 we have a presentation with, with who we are, um, our values, what we represent. We have a video, it's quite emotional, uh, I think that after all, it works in sales to have a video. Sometimes it's better a one-minute video with nice music, and especially if it's something that appealing as football that people might enjoy rather than a super long presentation. And, but we have, the, we have a, a document to present, but we cut all, this, all, the, all the slides that were explaining our partnership uh, package and what we deliver, what we can do for you. We, we cut that. When we go to, to a brand, we explain who we are. As Tim was saying, we want to listen a lot because I think that's what, I mean, Tim obviously said, appreciate. We don't go there like, this is our package, this is what we can do for you, do you want it, yes or no? I don't think that works. I think it's <coughs> like going there, trying to establish a relationship, you know, uh, if you can go for dinner, uh, you know, be in touch, invite them for a game, uh, etc. And then you can establish a connection there and then if in, the, in the discussion you find out there is a specific need or there is something that you can fulfill, then you can come back with a proposal and then you are in another stage of the conversation. But I think that sometimes salespeople, we, we, we are, we've been, I've been uh, very obsessed with this first meeting coming with, you know, the, the, it's a super moment and it's, it's not. It's really like stepping in in the right way, not trying to be too ambitious, not trying to, 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 to try to show the brand you know more than them because it's not true. Try to listen a lot, explain very honestly who you are and if there is a fit or an interest, you will sit in that meeting and then you are one yeah. step ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And that, just to come back, because I said about spend the time doing a bit more research on the right ones, get that time from not doing, uh, uh, Tim and me, are I can imagine, can guess what our logo looks like on a billboard at your stadium. But you know, the number of times we see all these slides and they've put it onto everything and I go, just don't waste your time on that. Yeah. Spend the time on doing two or three really good things up front that tell us who you are, what your objectives are, and doing a bit of research on what yeah, yeah, we're likely yeah, to respond yeah. to, because all of that yeah. is, that's almost the, the box ticking. Andy, I just, just want to say, I know we've got some agencies here, I would say that the, the best proposal I've ever seen, or presentation I've ever seen, was from an agency quite recently that came in and actually de demonstrated a completely new approach to how to engage audiences. And if they'd said go and sponsor a, a kite flying competition in Japan because of this insight, we'd have considered it. it. You know, it was really quite radical. They came in, they said, we'd like to demonstrate to you a new approach to how to engage audiences. Bang. The whole, you know, we could have filled that room with the whole marketing team because everybody wanted to learn about it. It was an insight, it was inspirational. They walked out of the room and actually they ended up doing quite a lot of work for us. So it was just something really inspiring. You know, and it's exactly the same with a, with a football club or a rights holder. You just gotta come in and excite people. Give us something new. Tell us something different. If you come in and say, with the greatest respect, if Barcelona come in and say exactly the same as Man United or Liverpool or Bayern Munich, there's no differentiation. Come in and just be very different. Grand, five, four minutes, 57 seconds left for questions. Does anybody have a question? I, I don't know if we've got, Mike. yes, we have got microphones. Chap in the pink shirt here and then the guy at the back after that. Good afternoon. Uh, I am actually, I work uh, in Southeast Asia. We work with UNICEF using football as a tool for development. And one of the big challenges that we have, um, we work with quite a few large brands, um, global names, is there's quite a disconnect between sponsors, commercial departments, and um, CSR and foundations. And what we found is um, the trend in terms of, a, you spoke about a sponsorship shift and a paradigm shift, there's also a consumer shift. 
Uh, consumers are now looking at businesses that have a mission. You know, what I think what Toby touched on, what does your brand stand for? And we've seen the new multi or the new billion dollar companies like Uber uh, and Airbnb, they have a social mission. They want to make the, the roads cleaner. So my question really is, uh, one is, uh, forgive me, I don't know the, the gentleman from Barcelona, your partnership with UNICEF, are there any tangible data that you have that that relationship has has been strengthened um, or, or that it's actually brought value back to, to Barcelona through that partnership? And secondly, um, do you feel within your own businesses there should be more of a vertical integration between the activities of CSR um, as well as commercial sponsorships just because they are now becoming more and more interlinked? And, and just finally, I know it's a long one, um, one of the challenges that we have also is for example, if I use Hyundai as an example, uh, they have a, a global sponsorship with the World Cup. If we speak into their uh, local teams in Asia, there is a complete disconnect that their activities in Asia are nothing to do with football, um, as opposed to, to, to the head office which sponsors the World Cup. So again, it's, it's very disconnected, it seems, and I just wondered if you feel that there needs to be more of an internal process to, to integrate that. A lot of questions there. Yeah. So we start, Julie, with you, and we'll let be as prompt as we can so we can give yeah. some other people a, a, an audience. So. Yeah, I'll try to respond as quick as I can. I mean, as you know, the UNICEF partnership comes a long way and starts very strongly being on, the, on, uh, on our jersey on, uh, on, on match day, uh, which, uh, as Toby was saying, we're, we're standing for something. Uh, we still are, uh, in terms of partnership with them. I mean, as you know, not in the front of the jersey, in the back. Um, actually, UEFA had to change the rule of having uh, uh, NGOs on the back because, because of the UNICEF push from our side. Uh, but the, from our side, the, the, the partnership with them remains as strong or even more in terms of what we're doing together with them in terms of what we contribute. We still contribute uh, $1.5 million uh, to them every, every year. We have programs with them uh, all over the world. We signed last year the 1 in 11 program in New York. Uh, we have, uh, which is a different deal, but, but it comes together, Messi as a UNICEF ambassador. So uh, it's, it's our main partner uh, in, for the foundation. We have, sorry, are you having back, having measures? We, I mean, to be honest with you, I, can don't, I don't have anything to tell you this is what we got back. I mean, it's really driven by our foundation. They have several programs around the world. Uh, we, we collaborate in different parts of the world. When we do the summer tour, we have a specific activities with, <coughs> sorry, with them. In the US uh, this, this summer, we had an event with them where we brought players and so on, some kids to, to, to explain what we're doing. So it's not something that we do to measure uh, I mean, we, we do many things with them, different events, focus on youth, which is the main focus of our foundation. Uh, and I think that overall, what has provided to us is a big help on the image of the club around the world. And that's, I think it's, it's intangible. You cannot really measure that. It's huge. Everybody knows about the UNICEF partnership, but I cannot give you an exact number of anything more concrete than that. But it's been huge for the club and it will remain to be uh, as big for the future. Quick reflection, okay, maybe just one quick, quick I think, reflection. I think the answer to your question is from a normal brand point of view, as you measure it, you see whether it changes the brand equity yeah. scores, mm -hmm. trust, warmth, and things like that. It's fairly simple. Um, in terms of your question on CSR, I think part of the piece we talked before about commercial marketing sponsorship, CSR used to be another one. You know, that model was always wrong. It's now disappearing in almost all companies. The funding is still there, but it's coming in as part of one pot. And as you build a program, or certainly in our case, we're looking to do programs that deliver the traditional stuff, some of the new world stuff, and also the CSR element is absolutely lined up within that, which is a far more logical way for people to engage. Can I just say that the, the, the Hyundai scenario that you, that you put in, the nuances in terms of charitable giving and awareness, you know, if you go to the Eastern, former Eastern Bloc countries, charity is not on the radar. I've just spent a week in, in Kiev on holiday, um, and you know, charity is not on their radar. They don't have charity. So to your point about Hyundai, you know, it doesn't fit their model everywhere. I'm conscious that this red, this red clock is flashing at me, but can we have one, are we allowed one more question? The second man to put his hand up, which is the guy at the back left there. And I, I'm probably gonna be given the thumb screws to shut up and get off stage and introduce the next panel. Thank you. Um, I thought the, um, all the stuff around moving from analog to digital 
really resonated. I think it's really obvious. One of the things that when we're talking to rights holders, I had a conversation with a commercial director from a football club, um, kind of fairly candid. He said, look, my role is becoming more and more um, marginal because of the broadcast rights deal, so big. And therefore, for brands to be important, the number needs to be so big, and therefore, that becomes difficult to get. So how, how, how basically, he was saying, how can I become more relevant? Because my chairman and my owner want to see the manager more. He wants to see the people responsible for player trading. Actually, the commercial director has just gone down the pecking order. 10 years ago, it would have been completely different. So I think that's the challenge. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, but in my experience, the, the commercial revenue, the sponsorship revenue is still a line item on the budget and it still gets the attention of the CFO and the, and the CEO within the football club. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the, 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 the TV money now is, is so significant, but the Premier League and the football clubs in the Premier League, I think, still worry a great deal about commercial revenue. But you're right, the balance of power has certainly shifted from, from sponsorship to broadcast. Um, I think I'm probably going to have to shut up now, so apologies we couldn't take more questions, but thank you very much for listening. I think I'm handing over, uh, once we do a little, a little jiggery-pokery with the microphones, to Ben Wells, who's going to um, talk a little bit more about the, um, the ESSA Convention, but particularly this idea, is official dead? I know a lot of rights holders, especially in football, will sell official this and official that, but the debate is, is that model dead? Are we moving towards a new model? So give us five minutes to turn around and we'll be back, or Ben will be back. Thank you very much. Thank you.